We're going to um, go come up into the uh, modern and contemporary period. Um, and in a room full of uh, textual scholars, I want to encourage us to think about some of these images as uh, visual texts that require um, as much decoding and deciphering as any written text. Um, that's uh, kind of my methodology as, as a uh, sort of uh, visual culture and, and material culture as well. Okay, so um, I would like to um, build on Robert Sharp's simple yet significant insight um, that the so-called two world mandalas of esoteric Shimon Buddhism function primarily as potent agents of ritual and spiritual empowerment, not necessarily inner experience. I will extend his functional analysis, however, to examine precisely how repositioning these powerful images can affect the reading of empowered uh, of the ritual space. So first, um, I'd like to make a few comments just about the power of the mandalas themselves um, before I then review the two standard installation models for the mandala, namely uh, the mandalas, namely the parallel, what I'm calling the parallel confrontation model and the frontal display model. And finally, I'd like to show how Shimon's mandala motif is currently being installed and adapted to novel contexts in contemporary Japan. Emplacements on doors, on ceilings, behind founders' portraits, or even arguably in government buildings, uh, all suggest that the functions of Shimon's double mandala motif range from individual commemoration and propitiation to advancing sectarian, and maybe I'd like to suggest, and it's speculative, but debatably, um, national agendas as well. So here we have the two world mandalas. I don't think I need to explain the, this is too much. I think this, these images are probably familiar to all of those here in the room. Um, but um, yeah, um, originally and historically speaking, the two world mandalas are traditionally displayed together um, in the ceremonial hall to empower the space and transform it into Dainichi's Dharmadhatu. Like Vajrayana microchips or esoteric superconductors, they help to telescope and channel Dainichi's universal energy into the microcosmic ritual hall, zapping it and filling it with the unlimited power and authority of a resident sage king or an enlightened sovereign. And of course, we have this explicit um, imagery depicting Dainichi himself in royal garb, wearing a crown as befitting any great Chakravartin or virtuous world ruler. Dainichi resides within and presides over these twin mandala palaces, which I've argued elsewhere were shaped by contemporary Chinese prototypes for powerful, perfect palaces. And I have some slides at the very end if we want to go into that um, during Q&A. Um, this is perhaps a bit of a review for most of you, uh, but it's worth briefly recalling Shingon's traditional spatial arrangements for ritual empowerment in Japan. It's quite possible that Kukai was the first to display uh, the mandalas together as a pair uh, to mimic the ideal bicameral double palace system of Sino-Japanese capitals. So in the parallel confrontation model, the two mandalas are hung facing one another along the side walls perpendicular to the main altar. Together with the Tengai canopy and the Hongzong main image, the mandalas energize and empower the ritual actions in between. When the mandalas are displayed in this manner, we should read the ritual space as one of initiation or state protection, as often the kinds of rituals that go on in this setup. Uh, at Muroji, for example, the 9th century Hondo um, still displays this arrangement for initiation rituals. It features a floor to ceiling diamond world mandala on the left, and beyond the contours of this image, a loom world mandala on the right. Its main honzon is Nyorin Kanon in the center, and this hall is also known as the Kanjodo because it is the site of Kitchen Kanjo initiation ceremonies in which the initiate establishes a karmic bond with one of the deities depicted in the mandala. And this is also, uh, this parallel confrontation model is also uh, on display at Kanshinji in Osaka. Um, this parallel confrontation model is also deployed in annual state protecting rites that Kukai inaugurated just a few months before his death in the spring of 835. Um, his latter seven day rite, the Go Shishinichi Mishu Ho, provided the Buddhist complement to other ceremonies held during the first week of the new year. Here we see a copy of the late 12th century illustrated hand scroll of annual ceremonies, the Ninju Yogi Maki. 
The two world mandalas are suspended flush against the side walls of the specially constructed Qinggong Chapel within the Imperial Palace, and ritual altars are set up before them. Um, and then we also see um, the five wrathful wisdom kings, the uh, Jarada, the Raja, uh, appear along the far back wall with offertory stands before them. Do you have a pointer? Um, but here we see the diamond world kind of flush on the left, and then the world, world is on the right. Okay, so that's fine. Fair enough. Uh, where are I? Yes. Um, the frontal display model, by contrast, simply suspends the two mandalas directly behind the main altar. This is the standard arrangements for any go arrangement for any goma fire ceremony, and we should read the ritual space as one is for the purification of defilements or delusions that can cause physical or mental dis-ease. At Osaka Kokubunchi, for example, the two world mandalas are suspended directly behind the healing medicine Buddha, Yakshi Nyorai. He is flanked by Nikko and Gakko, um, who personify the light of the sun and moon, respectively. This temple dates to the reign of Emperor Shomu, who established a network of national Buddhist temples for Kokubunji in seven, uh, 741. Um, and though the temple was destroyed by fire many times since then, this is a typical sculptural arrangement for the period. And we can think of Yakshiji and Shinyakshiji in Nara, for example, as comparative uh, cases. The post 9th century edition of the two Shingon mandalas behind Nikko and Gakko, however, is an altogether innovative edition. Iconographically speaking, um, the white moon discs on the left-hand diamond world match and magnify the power of the white moon disc held by Gakko. Likewise, the right-hand moon world mandala is beyond the contours of this photo, but its central red lotus flower also matches and magnifies the power of the red sun disc held by Nikko. And of course, this is the same red, white um, uh, symbolism of principle and wisdom that we've seen, uh, heard from Lucia Dolce as well and we are as well known to many of us. Um, the frontal installation of the two mandalas here means that we need to read the ritual space in a different way than before. Put simply, the message here is that the old exoteric Nara Buddhism heals well, but these new esoteric images can help it be healed better than before. Placing these mandalas behind the old Nara statues pumps up the power of the inexact ritual science of, of exoteric Buddhism and charges their customary charism with Dainichi's even deeper prior power. They simultaneously complement yet supplement Kokubunji's established ritual technologies for purification and healing. So directly Face, so I'm going to move on to contemporary variations now. Directly facing this main hall across the courtyard at Osaka Kokubunji, there is a memorial to the bell tower with an altogether unique configuration. It was constructed in 1970 to commemorate the victims of a nearby gas explosion in the neighborhood. You can see the temple bell suspended above in the top half of the memorial hall and a bronze Jizo-sama below, fulfilling, fulfilling his traditional role as a psychopomp to the departed spirits enshrined within. This is a Shingi Shingon temple, so there's an interesting conflation of Shingon and Pure Land elements here. The doors on the inside, the inside doors to the memorial hall, however, um, we can see uh, bronze plaques of the womb and diamond worlds. The inscription above the list of names explains that they are, quote, the late victims of the actual site of the subway construction gas explosion incident. Chikatetsu Koji, Genjo, Bakahatsuji, Koki Seisha. It is dated April 8, 1970, or Showa 45. Interestingly, uh, most of the women's names ending in ko are listed on the wool world side, while most of the men's names appear on the diamond world side. This adds an explicitly gendered dimension to commemorating the dead and to reading the spatial hermeneutics of this mandala-empowered memorial hall. The Sakopamp Jizo is also the main honzon of a Hasegara temple, sub-temple in Nara prefecture. Here, the extremely interesting, and some may say kitsch, combination of esoteric and pure land elements uh, make us read the ritual space in a wholly novel way. Hasegara's small subtemple is dedicated to Mizuko, that is stillborn, miscarried, or aborted fetuses. Jizo Sama stands in the center of the altar, piled high with candy and cookie offerings, while pudgy little babies clamber up his arms and legs. He is flanked by two bodhisattva statues with bent knees. Um, this is a typical Henso Raibo pose um, that signals their readiness to descend rapidly and escort the children back to be reborn in the Pure Land. And Kukai looks on from the side. 
Directly above this mise-en-scene is a coffered ceiling with each square panel showing a doll, a toy, or other plaything for children. In the center, we see the red lotus flower of the womb world mandala. Doctrinally, the womb world symbolizes the Tapagatagarma principle that embryonic Buddhahood can be birthed in the phenomenal realm. However, in the context of musical kuyo rituals, the uterine associations of the womb world mandala take on a much more poignant meaning for any grieving mother praying within. The reading of the space here becomes one of propitiation, um, as the former parent prays for the peaceful repose, uh, peaceful rebirth of the departed child up in heavenly realm. Indeed, the placement of womb world imagery on the coffered ceiling draws upon the long-standing pan-Asian architectural device known as the Well of Heaven. Um, and we can think of the actual kanji for wells, kind of a tic-tac-toe grid, right? And so in a coffered ceiling context, this Well of Heaven is, uh, indicates kind of a passageway up into heaven, uh, an inverted well up into heaven. Um, and I believe if Neil Schmidt is going to be talking, I think he's going to be talking about the Dome of Heaven um, later on. I don't know if he's actually going to do that, but there, it's a long-standing kind of um, uh, motif in, in uh, East Asian uh, architectural history. Okay. Um, thus, Hasidada's modified children's mandala on the ceiling should be read as a particularly compassionate conduit for the musical's fortunate rebirth in a heavenly pure land. Now, the gendered associations of womb and diamond world are further deployed in the modern esoteric lay movements such as Shinyoen, the Garden of Truth. It was established in 1936 by the couple shown here. On the right, Ito Tomoji stands next to her husband, Ito Shinjo, on the left. Their portraits are strategically installed on the right and left sides of the Gomadan altar in the Shinyoen's large Yuan Shoja temple constructed in 1975. Here on the second floor, the mandala room displays Tomoji's posthumous portrait immediately to the right of the right-hand womb world mandala, while Shinjo's similarly painted portrait hangs directly on the left, next to the left-hand diamond world. To anyone attuned to the highly symbolic visual conventions of esoteric Buddhist altar arrangements, the right-left display of the mother-father founder's portraits seems hardly arbitrary. In fact, in his memoir, The Path to Oneness, Ichinyo no Michi, Ito Shinjo explicitly asserts that, quote, as for myself and Tomoji, I am of the heavenly spiritual lineage while she is of the earthly one. This means that we are opposite, like yin and yang. In esoteric Buddhism, it is like the diamond world and the womb world, end quote. We can therefore read this ritual space as symbolically advancing Shinyoen's sectarian agenda. This emplacement legitimates their leadership by aligning their likenesses with traditional mikyo mandalas that are two but not two, ni fu ni. Okay, now my last example, I'm, I'm kind of going up on a limb here and I recognize that this is highly speculative and this is just my own reading. Um, the little backstory here, um, uh, several years ago we were in Japan and as part of the Fulbright we had a tour to the Supreme Court of Japan. And as soon as I walked in at the, the law library section, there were two enormous pictures um, of Shoto Kutaishi, and I'll show you them in a minute, um, by Domoto Incho, who was a Mikyo iconographer and then later abstract expressionist, etc. But um, trained as a classical iconographer. And it, I was working on, on the mandalas at the time, and it just suddenly hit me, that's what's going on here. But that's just me. I look forward to your comments and see to what extent this may or may not um, hold true. Okay, so um, I would like to suggest that we might consider another gendered mandala-like or mandala-influenced installation strategy that empowers and alters the strictly secular reading of a government building in Japan. Specifically, I would like to suggest that Domoto Insho's 1951 installation of Shotoku Taishi imagery in the Supreme Court of Justice in Tokyo follows this dual mandala installation uh, arrangement. Now, Domoto was a classically trained Buddhist iconographer who fulfilled commissions at such eminent Nikkyo temples as Minaji in 1931, Toji in 1934, and Sanboin, a sub-temple of Daigoji in 1936. Most notably, he also painted the 15 large-scale wall paintings and 16 pillar paintings in the Konkon Daito of Koyasan in 1942. He himself was a devout Buddhist practitioner and began drawing only after intensive scriptural and commentarial study, ritual purification with well water, and daily chanting of the Heart Sutra. 
He was not only familiar with, but extraordinarily knowledgeable about the symbolism of the two world mandalas. Despite this rich religious background, no art historian today has made the connection to any of his so-called secular paintings. So, now, in circa 1951, Domoto installed two large images of Shoto Taishi directly behind the seats of the Supreme Court justices. You can see them to scale here, despite the poor quality of the photo. On the right, he painted the prince's mother and attendants, and on the left, he painted the prince with his advisors. I would like to suggest that these explicitly gendered scenes of feminine love and compassion on the right and masculine wisdom on the left reflect and reimagine the symbolism of the womb and diamond world, respectively. I suggest this reading, especially because the right-hand maternal scene is an extremely rare compositional choice. Shotok Taishi as a child is usually only ever depicted alone, right, with hands in gashou, um, uh, never with his mother. In addition, as Yasuko, uh, art historian Yasuko Tsuchikane has pointed out, uh, she's an expert on, on Domoto Incho, uh, this deliberate choice of women on the right-hand side could reflect the promise of women's suffrage in the new post-war constitution of 1947. This would nicely complement and complete the left-hand traditional image of Shotok Taishi promulgating Japan's first 17-article constitution in 604 CE. As a result, I suggest that we read this supposedly secular juridical space through the lens of the two-world mandala installation convention. By borrowing from traditional Shingon altar arrangements and by emplacing these two images behind the highest constitutional court of Japan, Domoto mimicked but modified the mandala's historic role in the pacification and protection of the family state, the Chingaku Kyo. The explicit national symbolism is made even clearer in a third image of Shotok Taishi that apparently hung flush against the back wall of the Supreme Court chamber, directly facing the judges. So they've had the two behind them and they're facing this third image of Shotok Taishi in front. Um, it depicts a hagiographic episode when Prince Shotok Taichi mounts his horse and flies over Mount Fuji, the stock symbol for the nation of Japan. Art historians have interpreted this suite of images to represent the three Neo-Confucian qualities of benevolence, wisdom, and virtue, but I believe there is a much more explicit nationalistic agenda at work in these paintings. That is, a more contextual reading of the space would indicate that with Shoto Kutaishi's mandala-like compassion and wisdom behind them, the judges were empowered to protect the state and uphold the constitution with the nation of Japan foremost in their mind's eye. To conclude, these new and unique installation strategies speak to the versatility and adaptability of the two-world mandala motif and to the continued relevance of esoteric imagery in modern Japan. But they also speak to the need for new and original contextualized readings of these empowered and empowering spaces. We have seen how they help to commemorate victims within a bell tower, or propitiate departed children under the well of heaven, or legitimate two modern esoteric sectarian founders, or arguably protect the nation state in the highest court of the land, though I admit this may be a debatable point. I look forward to your comments and questions so I can refine my argument further. Thank you very much.